University of Prince Edward Island, Canada. Uh, and uh, then we have uh, Ms. Tarandeep Randhava. Uh, she is software developer uh, with IBM. Uh -huh. And we have with us uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Babu Shehbaz uh, from uh, University of Agriculture, Kastrabad. Uh, the topic uh, uh, that we uh, chose, uh, precision agriculture and uh, artificial intelligence technology in Pakistan, uh, prospects and uh, opportunities. I think it has become uh, more relevant, not only in the context of uh, fourth industrial revolution that uh, uh, the world is trying to embark upon, uh, but also in case of Pakistan, in the context of disasters and floods. Uh, one of the uh, advantage and uh, benefit of uh, uh, use of technology, use of artificial uh, intelligence uh, in uh, agriculture uh, is uh, early warning, its adaptation uh, to uh, the changing uh, climate, uh, it's uh, getting to know about uh, uh, what would happen, how soon and how fast and at what magnitude and uh, what can be uh, done about uh, it. Uh, it is also about uh, uh, the post-disaster surveillance and uh, uh, monitoring, for example, now, if uh, in the uh, water submerged uh, lands of uh, uh, Sin, uh, where it is uh, difficult to, uh, physically uh, for research team to go, they can make uh, the best use of drones. Uh, they can capture images and they can uh, understand uh, what is happening there. Uh, similarly, uh, with the use of uh, uh, the GIS maps uh, before and after flood and uh, uh, 2010 floods and uh, 22 floods, uh, in Pakistan, now the researchers they are trying to see uh, the differences and similarities of uh, what happened and uh, uh, what went wrong uh, uh, where. Uh, and uh, moreover, not only uh, in the times of uh, disasters, uh, also uh, in the uh, times of uh, uh, your uh, uh, normal uh, agriculture, I think the way forward for food uh, security uh, is sustainable production and sustainable consumption. And for sustainable production, uh, use of uh, Internet of Things, use of artificial intelligence, use of mathematical modeling, uh, use of precision agriculture, uh, that has become uh, uh, very important. Now, as uh, the experts, they would be uh, uh, educating us. Uh, they have uh, got the technologies that uh, while a tractor, uh, while it's uh, uh, driving on land, it would be the sensors. Uh, they would be able to tell us precisely uh, what are the nutrient uh, deficiency in the uh, soil, uh, whether we have to put uh, potash uh, fertilizer or uh, sulfur fertilizer, what's the pH value, what's the moisture content, uh, et cetera. And uh, uh, these uh, then in turn would make uh, uh, the farmers, uh, their decisions uh, very informed and uh, uh, very easy uh, to actually uh, take actions, uh, what to do when in their farmlands and uh, how to improve the productivity uh, of uh, their uh, crops. Uh, similarly, uh, the use of technology for uh, pest management and pest warning, pest monitoring. Uh, again, uh, uh, this is uh, something where uh, technology is uh, uh, being widely uh, used. Uh, and not only uh, uh, this, uh, actually it starts from pre-sowing till uh, the food comes on our table. So from field to fork, there's the complete supply chain. Uh, that gets uh, served uh, through uh, use of uh, precision agriculture, through use of AI technologies, uh, the uh, uh, seed drill machines. Uh, they are now uh, equipped with the uh, artificial intelligence. They tell uh, at uh, what depth uh, the seed needs to be sown and at uh, what distance. Uh, uh, and uh, then, of course, the production. Uh, so in order to cover this uh, whole uh, uh, arena uh, and uh, uh, the things uh, that we uh, talked about, uh, uh, we thought uh, uh, that uh, we should uh, learn from uh, our uh, uh, partner uh, university, University of uh, Prince Edward uh, Island, uh, their experts, and of course, uh, University of Agriculture, Faisalabad, which is the leading agriculture university in Pakistan. Uh, we have uh, brought their experts together and uh, uh, we look forward to uh, hear from them. Uh, I'll uh, request uh, my colleague uh, Kashif uh, to moderate it. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abit, for the welcome remarks and introduction of the concept uh, which we are going to discuss. Right now, uh, a bit further ado, I now request our panelists to uh, present their uh, uh, talk on uh, on the subject of this uh, seminar. Uh, each panelist has 12 to 15 minutes, 
And after the three panelists, we uh, ask for the questions and then uh, later on, we request uh, Dr. Baba Shabazz for the special notes. So first of all, I request uh, Dr. Etizaz Farooq for the questions. So we need to have a presentation. Yes, yeah, fine. If you, if you, whatever you call it. How do we move the slide? Next, next Maybe they have a point. Thank you, Dr. Abid. Th thank you, Dr. Abid, for the invitation and uh, hosting us. So I'm Atazaz Farooq, as uh, mentioned, and I'm currently serving as Associate Dean for the School of Climate Change and Adaptation. And uh, my research expertise are in precision agriculture. And I'm an agriculture engineer, engineering background from University of Agriculture, Faisalabad. So, Let's talk a little bit about uh, the about the agriculture challenges. So, as I said, so I'll be talking more on the application of the technology for smart agriculture. So, what are the challenges? So, population is a challenge. Then we need to provide more food and fiber. Also, the land accessibility because of the urbanization is a challenge, and we need to work together to to adopt and mitigate those challenges and provide opportunities by using the technology. And also over the past 50 years, we are dealing with uh, climate change and we witnessed this uh, very severe flood in Pakistan and that has to do with, uh, with the climate change and emissions. So over the past 50 years, uh, the agriculture emissions, which are roughly around 30% of the total emissions that has been doubled because of the intensification of the agriculture industry. So now how we can do that better? And uh, uh, since uh, Dr. Abid uh, want us to talk a little uh, on the agriculture, uh, pristine agriculture opportunities and perspective. So I would like to keep Keep it that way. Next slide, thumbs up to slides. We are related to agriculture. So, pristine agriculture is the science or system that encounters the variability within the field. And then we act on it, we manage that variability using the technology and implement. And then when we do that, we improve the profitability, reduce production costs, and at the same time, mitigate environmental risk. And this is another definition of not going to read, so that's more or less the same. So when we talk about pristine agriculture, so there are different kinds of sensors, and uh, there are there are few on this slide. So and there are many, many more. So for example, GPS has been very common for georeferencing. There are cameras, and then uh, at induction, moisture sensors, Internet of Things, drones are becoming popular these days. Then when we are talking about plant high, we have ultrasonic sensors, slow sensors, and all they do is uh, capture that information as we go. So first step in seeing agriculture is like the site, then uh, we're gonna capture and quantify that variability. So those are some sites which I selected last year, and those are the sampling points on those. So this is one of the technology which is now commercially available. So we call it dual EM sensor of that for soil electrical conductivity. So it creates magnetic field within the soil. And then based on the strength of the magnetic field, we can identify how strong the soil is. And then there is a built-in GPS. We can drag and remind an operating vehicle or tractor or anything like that. And at the end, it's going to develop some, a map for us like this using GIS. And in this map, if you look at the left side, so the red areas are least productive areas, green areas are highly productive areas. Now the, the idea is to feed your best at least, not, not uniform. So for the optimization of resource allocation, and uh, to be efficient and develop the smart agriculture brand. You know? And one of the keynote speakers I had the 
over in July when we had the Canadian Society of Bioengineering. So he mentioned this is not uh, your grandfather's agriculture anymore. So it has to be innovative, it has to be smart and best. So now th this is what we get. And uh, next step, as we know, so we apply inputs. So this is a field. So again, we map with the SWAT technology, which is a soil and water topographic map. So that is the combination of the combination of the uh, this conductivity and slope because on Prince Edward Island, we are not flat. We need to take into account the topography. So then we had the checkpoints and the idea was that we went with Olympian strategy. We were 10% over and under in, in different productivity zones. So now we had the control areas, which are the shaded areas. Then we had the variable rate areas. So this was our prescription map. And then we did a calculation on that based on the applied map. So our rates were pretty much similar in both areas. Then this map get feeded into the variable rate uh, fertilizer spreader. And then this spreader is capable of changing the rates based on our allocation. And here is the yield map. So you can see there is a variation in the yield, less uh, uh, red areas are the least productive areas and the uh, uh, green areas are highly productive areas. So if it is green or red all over the place, that means there is no variability, that uh, the field is uniform, then we can go with the uniform practice. But once we are dealing with the variability, we have to manage that variability. And then we did an economic analysis uh, of uh, this study. And then, but we found that on an average, we were able to save 21 more dollars per acre with a potash application. And then now we are using these prescription maps for liming. We are using that for irrigation and nitrogen application to broaden that uh, profitability. So now with that, so in terms of the, in terms of the yield, so we were able to produce over 300 pounds per acre to justify some of the cost. And uh, now at the commercial level, over 35,000 acres on Prince Edward Island. Remember we are the smallest province of Canada, over 35,000 acres are managed with this technology, and which is huge in terms of the production cost and also in terms of the environmental efficiency and profitability. So another uh, area which I wanna highlight light is drone. And these days drones are getting very popular and uh, there are simple steps, flight planning, then capturing whether of information, whether that is multispectral or thermal cameras, and then process those images. And at the end of the day, come up with a nice looking map with the variability in it. So here is a, one example you can see. So as I said, so we are an island, so we are dealing with a lot of erosion. So now this is the top image on the left that is taken prior to planting. You can clearly see that where the water is going to flow and where will be those erosion paths. Then everything get planted, everything disappears. We were not able to capture anything. And then we did a thermal map or the thermal camera was mounted on the drone to do the imaging. You see the areas which were under erosion, they were heating up quicker from 10 to 15 degrees more compared to the cooler areas and the same areas were producing less. So we are doing a project with the provincial government and uh, doing a profitability mapping. Is it really profitable to cultivate everything? Maybe we want to leave that area and feed our best athletes and best, uh, best fields to capture more, more uh, more uh, yield and productivity. So another example from the SWAT mapping and uh, which is the soil and water topography map, red areas are least productive areas. The middle one is the NDVI map with our drone and the multispectral camera, right side is the yield map. And this is, there is about 80% matching. And I just wanna focus on one area, for example, this uh, on the bottom left, so red areas, yellow areas on the left side. So those are least productive areas. If you look at the yield and also the NDVI, the plants are not performing well. So now with the combination of the SWAT and the drone imagery, we were able to develop these practices and these are now implemented at a, at a very significant, a significant scale. So building on that, so some image translation so that we can use the same data for multiple 
purposes. So we have RGB imagery and then we converted that. So some applications, I'm not gonna spend more time on that. So let's get into a seeding trial, which we did uh, based, on the, based on the SWAT map. And this is using the drone. You can see the drone is able to capture the each and every plant and look at the planting density and look at the spacing and see how things are behaving within the field by managing variable rate. And again, the rationale behind the variable rate seeding is that we deal with the variability, we have erosion, our soil is not productive. Why to go with the standard spacing? And then we look at the, with this trial, we found that there was a significant increase in the yield when we went with the variable rate seeding. And now we have about 10 fields this year across Prince Edward Island, where we are evaluating this to reaffirm the results and validate the results. A little bit on the AI applications. So we developed this sprayer based on the machine vision and artificial intelligence. So this is for potato crop. It has three cameras, which goes over the three rows, capture the information, whether it is weed disease or bare soil, make the decision making as we go. We have our own control system. We use AI models, which get deployed after training, validation, and testing. And then here is one video, which if I can run, that's that's fine. So that was a lab testing which we did and also did the field testing. So it was over 90% accurate. Last application, I know I have 15 minutes, so I'm gonna wrap up. So that is evapotranspiration and crop water requirement. Again, we are using AI models to calculate the crop water requirement based on the weather data. And in the crop water requirement at different growth stages, we compared that with FAO 56 method. And then uh, we found that we were over 90% accurate. Also, we did the seasonal fluctuations. We captured those seasonal fluctuations. And then once we did that, we have that. So this is the walk forward validation concept and AI model, which is HD, uh, PIX2, PIX HD. And then the idea was to capture those crop water requirement during the season, prior to season, after the season, so that we can have a better estimation of that. And then we did a irrigation on based on that. And here is our rationale behind the irrigation. That uh, if you look at this chart, it's gonna show up here. Yeah. If you look at this chart, so this is the precipitation hills for our, uh, during the growing season, the red line is the crop water requirement. Clearly you can see in July and August, we are lacking. We need to provide and fill that gap to be sustainable. And in Prince Edward Island, potatoes are important to our economy. We produce about 30% of Canadian potatoes and that is about $10 billion industry. So the provincial government is very keen to make sure that we are sustainable and uh, we are known as Potato Island of Canada. So that's why we are going into supplement irrigation and providing, and since we are island, we cannot go with the blanket application of irrigation because we don't wanna get into salt water intrusion issues. So that's why we wanna be smart and wanna apply based on the need. And irrelevant of the irrigation system because of the climate change, weather patterns have shifted, rainfalls have shifted, and we were able to increase the yield significantly when we compare to the... One last slide. So this, is, this might be useful for uh, Pakistan context too. So we have developed the early warning system which, where we have installed the gauges around the island which we monitor. And here is the website. You can see weatherbiclimate.ca. So that is governed by the Prince Edward Island uh, School of Climate Change and uh, Adaptation. So here you will see three, four different apps. So we have one app which uh, does, the, does the water monitoring and see how much is the sea level rise and whether that rise is uh, too high that it's gonna cause us erosion. And now with this, uh, we also monitor about 100 weather stations on island. And you can see the intensity and, and spatial distribution. We are missing a few maybe, but uh, we, are, we are covering the, 
the idea is now which i proposed to the provincial government uh, 1.2 million dollar project is that we will use this weather data and predict the crop water requirement island wide on the province basis for different crops and so that we can provide an island with an information where they can use weather through app or interface and uh, do the and tailor their irrigation practices so at the end, uh, so uh, just to conclude, so we need, we are developing that technology. We need to be a little bit more sophisticated and keep building on it and make those technologies available commercially, apply our inputs based on that and evaluate the productivity benefits and also the environmental uh, benefits. And we need to promote the best management practices with the reduced GHG so that we are helping the, uh, we are mitigating the climate change and also the technology, whatever we develop, that uh, has to be user friendly. So that at the end of the day, and for Pakistan context, uh, I have been promoting and I have been say, answering this question many, many times. The answer is the spin-off companies where service providers are available at the union council basis or the seal basis, and they provide these services for the small farmer and they can get you, uh, get those services at the reasonable price for the, for the better. And at the end, uh, we also need to train, uh, train our uh, grad students, undergrad students to, to, uh, to build the capacity to operate that uh, advancement. And at the end, I would like to thank my funding agencies for their uh, significant funding contributions towards these projects. Also, my own grad students and undergrad students, postdocs, for their help and support to conduct this study. And thank you all for being here. And I can take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Izaz, uh, for providing a wonderful uh, insights about precision agriculture, and their experience related to uh, how you can uh, tackle with the challenges of different uh, uh, physical aspects of the farms where the yield is less and you, focus, you can focus on that area, how you can improve the, the yield in, uh, through precision agriculture and use of artificial intelligence. So if I uh, uh, quickly ask you one question that you have proposed that this spin-off services. So, so what, uh, what cropping pattern is uh, you have foresee that their services are more uh, required for that? It is cotton wheat or rice wheat or it's mixed. So in, within Pakistan, which areas do you consider that these are particularly very important for that aspect? Well, in my opinion, uh, Pakistani soils are exhausted, especially in the, in the central Punjab and southern Punjab where there is extensive cultivation and there is no break. For example, in Prince Edward, Prince Edward Island, so there is a three-year rotation imposed by the government. You cannot grow potatoes every single year. So you need to leave the, so something like that to build the soil, improve the organic matter. And in terms of technology, so there's SWAT service that is commercially available now in US and Canada and also in the Europe, it is practiced. Maybe, buying one equipment and and it it doesn't need to be done every year every eight to ten years one time and then because the soil texture don't change it remains the same the same way the organic matter so the conductivity is the combination of those factors where how strong is the magnetic field and then managing your inputs based on that and also providing our soils a bit of a breathing space so that the soil health is there that uh, that uh, we are not exhausting the soils that they are not uh, productive enough anymore to 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 get our targets thank you thank you very much uh, now i like to request uh, uh, mr gurjeet uh, rindavas uh, to talk about uh, their subject uh, uh, related to computational sciences uh, with with regard to precision agriculture and ai over to you thank you uh, hello, everyone. Um, so I'm a computer scientist. Uh, I uh, work uh, with the data science, AI, machine learning applications. Genomics uh, and uh, serious comparison is there. And uh, recently, I started working with uh, the on of precision agriculture. Uh, so when we talk about data science, it's uh, really broad term and uh, 
that is uh, basically that is a free field uh, where we take uh, things from other domains of deep mathematics and bring uh, other physical sciences and uh, apply them uh, um, on uh, different kind of domains for different problems. Uh, when we talk about artificial intelligence, it's uh, nothing but just uh, using mathematical model, uh, giving some sort of ability to machines to uh, make our lives easier. Uh, we want them to perform some tasks there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so when we talk about uh, data science uh, pipeline, irrespective of the domain, uh, the problem begins with uh, finding questions what we want to answer. So data is there, um, say in agriculture or in any other field, data is being generated at very rapid rate, right? So uh, talking about social media, everybody has devices. Uh, we, we talk so much, uh, we communicate so much. Uh, all say malls, shops, uh, they have uh, their machines where they are doing so many transactions. Um, so data is there, data is not an issue in agriculture. Say you have sensors uh, for weather forecasting, you have sensors, you are collecting those data. Uh, but then how to use that data, that's where the problem begins. So what question we want our machine to answer. Um, so first thing would be to defining our problem statement or finding the right question that we want to answer. And uh, then organizing our data in such a way that those questions can be answered. Um, so data could be, uh, again, you, you may have too much data you think, but uh, then uh, say you are missing few entries in there. Um, like uh, to do with uh, temperature or to deal with uh, weather, say a few of your sensors, they went down, so their battery got died or you have very severe weather and they just died and you missed a few entries, um, then how to tackle that? And uh, this time-based data, you, you can't just take average of last one month. You'll have to look back years for that particular period and uh, just change that or update that. Uh, so around 70% of our effort as data scientists will be on data cleaning and pre-processing. And once data is ready to be processed, uh, then uh, uh, machine learning libraries, they are so strong, you just feed in the data and get the results back out of it. And once you have results, you can analyze and see, look for the reasoning why you're getting those results and uh, uh, establish the story uh, that if I'm getting these results, why, was, why is it so? You can look back at the literature, look back at other things and relate things. Uh, like when we talk about precision agriculture, we talk about many other problems, uh, why farmers are, like smaller farmers are moving away from agriculture because it's not profitable for them. What are the problems there? When we talk about climate change, flooding, uh, what's happening there? Uh, can we relate it with say use of more pesticides, herbicides? So I will say at the end of the day, these things are related. Uh, but to establish where is the correlation between those factors, we need uh, some intelligent models. Uh, so, uh, uh, so today I'll, I'll talk about one application, uh, uh, specifically this autonomous robot. Uh, this was the very first prototype we developed for manual weeding. Um, and uh, yes, please, uh, next slide. And uh, you, you can uh, see the, uh, how the things look like uh, with weeds and uh, crop without weeds. Uh, um, so we definitely want weeds to get removed, multiple benefits. Uh, uh, so you can increase the yield, uh, you can increase uh, the quality of the crop. Um, you can also increase the quality of the seeds that will be, you will be using in the following years. Um, so weed management is important. Okay. Um, the existing methods of weeding, uh, I would say uh, mostly in South Asia, we are uh, more dependent on manual labor. Okay, so we, we need people to do the jobs for us, uh, but the trend is changing. Okay, so uh, labor shortage is, uh, I would say, is everywhere nowadays, right? So you need more labor and you are relied on them uh, if they are available. Uh, so say from uh, whatever, uh, from harvesting to sowing to anything, uh, or the, say taking out the weeds, spraying, uh, you are dependent on somebody. Uh, and that way is not just uh, dependency, it's also expensive. Okay, so you add on labor cost that uh, you, you can basically tackle that with just one time expense. Uh, and again, as Dr. Patsar uh, said, uh, say you have one smart machine at say your PC level or at any other level, so you can 
uh, even government can service that and they say the machine is not expensive, it's slowly made. And uh, then you can provide the service to the local farmer. You can uh, basically address those issues. So one time cost, then you farmer will save the labor cost and automatically uh, uh, the agriculture will become little profitable for them. Um, also about nature impact. So if you have a way of removing uh, the weeds manually, uh, you don't have to rely on herbicides or I would say uh, in some crops, crops you'll still need it, but at least you can minimize the use. Um, and you'll also increase the crop yield because uh, now your uh, all the nutrients they'll be consumed by your crop plants, uh, and uh, you can uh, uh, grow your crops well of, uh, with good quality. Um, so with these benefits, uh, with this solution, uh, the question comes: uh, Why now? Uh, so now around the world there are regulations being imposed uh, by the governments. Uh, or we want to target uh, or meet uh, net zero emissions. Okay, so climate change, uh, is, uh, uh, say if uh, my neighboring country is doing uh, something silly, that's also gonna affect me. So same way, if any one country is bad, it's gonna affect the weather around the globe, right? So everybody uh, will have to work together to address this, uh, these issues. Um, so goal is, uh, can we, um, move towards a chemical free farming, or at least reduce the use uh, so that, and again, you'll, you must have seen, um, say uh, the good example would be, I can, I can remember from my childhood, uh, they used to spray to get rid of mosquitoes. And then uh, the mosquitoes, uh, they become resistant to it and it won't work anymore. And you need even further stronger chemicals to impose. Same thing with the crops, with the weeds, uh, you, you'll need more and more stronger things because uh, the resistance is gonna grow. It's, a, it's, a, it's just simple genetics. Um, so you can't just uh, uh, keep on doing that. You will need to look at the alternate ways. Um, so uh, now also uh, the AI hardware, which was uh, really expensive if I look a decade back, it's, it's not that expensive anymore. Uh, GPUs, they are relatively cheaper. Cameras, they are relatively cheaper. Uh, software you can uh, do in-house uh, with your uh, say you can have engineering students, computer science students, they can just code for you. Libraries are uh, uh, open source, freely available, you can use them. Uh, so how this, uh, the robot, uh, this robot works, is, uh, it uses many things from image processing, computer vision, machine learning, AI. Um, so we mounted some cameras, this was very first prototype and you can see even we do not have professional camera in there, it's just cell phone embedded in there and we have that machine learning application running on cell phones. So it's not even uh, computationally heavy. It can run on any average uh, system. And even cell phone camera, it's a cell relatively, I would say decent camera. It's uh, capturing uh, live uh, your uh, crops or what your fields. And then it's synced with the manual reader at the back end. And uh, our machine learning algorithms, uh, they are solving a classification problem. Uh, so the first problem, uh, it's just uh, from image processing, you capture image, uh, then you look for where is some plant and where is uh, no plant. That means just a green versus brown kind of um, classification, uh, sorry, the image uh, se uh, segmentation and uh, object detection problem. Uh, you solve that and once you have those areas where you have identified something green, then uh, comes the machine learning. So you can train your machine learning models um, on say images uh, of crop leaves that you are interested in. In this case, say uh, we train this model on images of uh, broccoli plants. So our model already knows how the broccoli plant will look like. And uh, from these uh, segmented uh, images, from these objects, uh, the machine learning model is just going to predict the label of these plants. So simple binary classification problem where it will just say whether this plant is my crop or not. If it's not crop, then just instruct the manual weeder there and it will take care uh, of the weed for you. It will just manually pull it out. Uh, so, next please. Uh, so I have uh, just explained it. Next, please. Uh, yes, if you can please play the video uh, so you can see the actual uh, working. Uh, so there's play button at the end with the uh, so it's, yeah. Okay, that's okay if you can just skip it then. 
or I don't know. Okay. So it works. So it's, uh, uh, you, you can now see that it's not very expensive to build and it can be done here. Um, this was our very first prototype. So the manual meter back there, it's, it's a not moving left, right. Uh, but in our current prototype, uh, even whenever it's going to encounter uh, uh, the crop plant, it'll move away from it. And uh, otherwise it's just gonna do, keep on doing its job. Uh, and everything is uh, happening uh, live. And this will also give you uh, the classification accuracy score that there's 80% chance this is broccoli or 90% chance this is broccoli, depending upon hardness of soil. Uh, you can adjust that threshold by yourself, uh, like uh, what you want to remove and not. Uh, yes, next piece. Uh, so if you can uh, play this one, this is, uh, um, again, uh, I would say the version two that is working uh, in the weed field. Uh, you can't use the same kind of uh, manual weeding tools uh, for every crop. Uh, so this is uh, something that we use in weed. And uh, I'll quickly see if this works. Uh, okay. Just let's wait for a couple of seconds, otherwise so we can skip. Punjab, India, and uh, 40 acre uh, land. And uh, this is totally organic farm uh, run by a charitable society called Pingalwara. Um, and uh, this was a testing field uh, to run this machine. And uh, what we have seen there is uh, it, uh, definitely increase the yield, uh, significantly increase the yield, and uh, no use of herbicide at all. Uh, and they were not using herbicide from a years in that field because uh, that was organic field, but at least uh, they have seen the increase in yield. <laughs> Um, so that's uh, what we noticed that uh, farmers can save on weeding cost of 50 percent. Uh, uh, that number we put uh, uh, if we want to use at a service based model where we still charge uh, small uh, farmers uh, based on say per acre. Uh, but if uh, government can just buy out few machines and uh, or manufacture them uh, uh, in a large scale and then just uh, at uh, say few villages they come up together and then they uh, their needs can be addressed with a single machine and that won't cost anything to the farmer. Um, again, uh, you can uh, minimize the use of herbicides, uh, improve crop health, and definitely it's good for environment if you're not using uh, uh, the chemicals and you're using uh, all the natural ways. Uh, next, please. Uh, so uh, we are working uh, towards uh, uh, many new things uh, related to this uh, project and uh, that I'll be working with uh, Dr. Ratzaz. Uh, so one thing would be uh, to design more tools uh, because this was uh, designed for, uh, I'd say, Indian soil. I would assume that a similar thing will work in Pakistan. Um, and now uh, we'll be taking this uh, in uh, Canada and uh, there will have a few different kind of issues like our uh, land size is large, field size is large. So we'll need a much commercial, bigger scale uh, systems. Uh, second thing is uh, will be uh, like soil hardness, uh, uh, hardness will be different. Um, and then there, uh, we do not level out the fields. Uh, so we will have to take that into account. So camera calibration uh, for improved uh, accuracy of uh, uh, those classifications, image capturing. Uh, so all those sort of things, plus also to make use uh, uh, of drones in the same project so that drone can communicate live uh, with this uh, uh, reward going on and uh, they can communicate and work together, uh, putting on more sensors so that we can also connect, uh, collect uh, data about the soil. We can uh, also put these things in field, uh, not for manual weeding, but uh, just classify and look at uh, 
uh, crop plants looking for particular diseases, any pests, uh, and uh, then analyzing those data in house. Uh, so those are a few of uh, our, I would say, ongoing projects, and then improving battery uh, life or something if we are going to use uh, bigger scale uh, machines. So those are uh, our goals for the next and. Uh, I think uh, that's all from, from my side. And if you have any questions, uh, please uh, do ask. Uh, otherwise, I'll uh, hand over the floor to you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gurjit. Actually, we will take questions after sure, uh, sure. Uh, the uh, presentation because then it's uh, better to get the idea of all the speakers and then we are request Dr. Robert. Now, I request uh, with you, uh, uh, I request. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Tarandi Prindava, and uh, she's a software developer to uh, uh, give us their perspective on precision agriculture and uh, AI. Hello, everyone. My name is Tarandi Prindava. I work as a software developer in IBM Canada. So. Today, I'm going to discuss the topic Earth Observation for Precision Agriculture. Let's get started. So if we think about a uh, farmer's perspective, how they think, what they are doing, and what they are feeling. So all small-scale farmers, as well as large-scale farmers, they always care about their crops. So their whole life revolves around the crops. They always keep track of weather forecast and climate changes that might impact their farms. They always think about what they should do for better crops. But in the end, how they, are, how they feel, they always feel frustrated because they need to keep track of weather and environmental changes manually. So we talk about problem scenario. So the problem is same for all the farmers all over the world. They need to keep track of crop health manually. They have harder access to real-time updates due to poor internet, as, a as well as they are also a victim of sudden environmental changes, as we see in a Pakistan. So from a user research like the surveys we did in IBM, we, uh, we searched that farmers are more concerned about Next one bag. Yeah. Yeah. Users. yeah. yeah.
so the farmers are more concerned about except uh, NDVR. It quantifies vegetation by measuring the difference between near infrared, which vegetation strongly reflects, and red light, which vegetation observed. So if the NDVI value close to one, that means there is a high possibility that it's a dense green leaves, like you can see from the picture. When NDVI is close to zero, there is likely no green leaves. So how this is beneficial to the farmer? So this will make the farmer life easier. They don't have to reach out for the information. The information is sent directly to them. Time management. The information and tips sent to them will help farmers direct their efforts for the day so they don't have to waste the time with unimportant tasks. So the information they got, they will be, it will be reliable and they, will uh, they have insights which will help in releasing their anxiety. And in the end, it will definitely lead in crop yield, higher crop yield. So through the use of free trials and simulated historical data, we were able to create a pro prototype that demonstrates that this solution is feasible. So though weather notification is an integral part of this app, but it has... It has many more things to offer. This app uses IBM Watson, which is an artificial intelligence based tool that can answer questions posed in natural language. This is a highly sophisticated system that can intelligently collect information by parsing millions of documents in a fraction of a second, analyze the collected information, and answer the queries with a confidence score. In our case, data is collected from multiple sources, including live feed from the satellites, and fed into this tool. This tool uses multiple machine learning algorithms to analyze the data in a real time and push out notification to the farmers in a real time. So this is how the prototype looks like. One more. Next, next, next. One. Next. I don't know why it's not coming. Okay, so there is a like thing where we can sign up, where customer can put his name, he can put his phone number, he can uh, look uh, put his location, and when they sign up, it will give preference regarding extreme weather conditions and NDVI reporting frequency daily, which is obtained by machine learning model, and that's how. Uh, farmer can receive alerts. Next. Next. So machine learning model, as I already mentioned, it uses Watson Studio. Okay. I think it's not showing up. That's okay. 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 That's okay. So it uses a machine learning model, Watson Studio Artificial Intelligence. It can, though we can see it, it is used to generate various models by generating various algorithms. However, we generate this model using historical corn and DVI value for good health and bad health. Next. So the inputs here, as I mentioned, the inputs here are days after sowing, uh, so that is age of the blood. And NDVI helps in checking the overall well-being of the crop. So it's not here, but it shows uh, the input is 97 comma 0 0.8. So 97 is the crop, like age of the crop, like 97 days is how old the crop is, which is read from the satellite API and 0 0.8 A show, uh, shows NDVI value. So this model returns a uh, value as zero and one. One means that this uh, plant is doing good, soil is doing good. So if the value is zero, the farmer needs to work on its crop to improve the health. So the pain points that I discussed, like farmer need a quick updates about their farm. So this is resolved by using SMS-based solution for quick updates. Also, farmer want to personalize insight and tips regarding their own farms. 
So this is solved by using machine learning and satellite data, which helps the farmer to let them know when they need to water the plants, when they need to put the fertilizer, and many more things. Next. Okay, as a recap, I can say that all scale, uh, all small scale, all local farmers, they always say, I hope my farming goes according to the plan today. So what they think, they think, how can I make more money? How can I be a better farmer? They always watch and listen for weather conditions and act accordingly. But they feel frustrated when things don't work out. <clears throat> So the happy roadmap for them is they can create an account online and adds location of farm. They received personalized farming tips via SMS, web, or mobile app. Farmers can analyze data on crops and NDI based on current state versus previous year's data. They will receive information on waste management and more. They are also able to recover from unexpected events and damages. In the bonus, they can also uh, use pest activity to control pesticide use. Also, they can also try to get the information about environmental impact from the nearby areas. That's all from my side. Thank you so much. And thank you for, so much for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Tarandeep, for a wonderful presentation uh, about the machine learning. Actually, uh, uh, it's very interesting to that the farmer get the uh, uh, with with uh, GIS and uh, uh, through uh, connectivity with an internet can get information about their soil, about their past and climate and whatever information our service provider is providing, they can get the information at the farm level and during the operations and after the operations and before the harvesting and after harvesting. So it's, it's very interesting to uh, learn from you and listen from you that this is going to happen and this is so uh, now I yeah. So now I invite uh, Dr. Babur uh, to uh, just uh, discuss about the special remarks that how this uh, this type of learning from uh, precision about precision agriculture and AI can be relevant for Pakistan's uh, Pakistan Pakistan perspective with with uh, agriculture. So over to you, Dr. Babur, for your insights. Especially if I can add. Uh, We'll be very interested to know uh, what's already being done uh, in our agriculture research institutions, uh, universities, and uh, uh, what is it that uh, we would like to uh, ask for uh, our partner institutions as technological cooperation? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abed. And uh, I thank you, thank all of the distinguished panelists for such a rich uh, research based uh, information they have delivered in such a short time. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, after the green revolution and uh, biotechnology and genetics revolution, this uh, precision agricultural technologies are the third era of uh, which is transforming agriculture. In fact, uh, we have seen the remarkable success of Green Revolution in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s. It has many uh, factors which contributed to the success of Green Revolution, mostly the heavy, very heavy investment in research, uh, infrastructure, markets, and policy support. And the adoption was very high. Biotechnology uh, revolution, uh, the world is far ahead from Pakistan, what we are doing and uh, but we are still struggling to catch up the pace of the world in the biotechnology field. And I can see the similar uh, things happening in case of uh, uh, precision agriculture technologies. The world is uh, moving very fast in this uh, era of, uh, in this niche era of uh, technology and in Pakistan, we are uh, still uh, a bit uh, behind. What I see with the precision agriculture from a farmer's perspective is basically uh, the major investment of farmer is on inputs. And the four R's are very important uh, when we are talking about the input application. These are the right source of uh, input, right rate of input application, right time at right place. 
So this is here where precision agriculture enters uh, in the case of input. I would like to uh, take you a very uh, quick academic debate that how, why, and why, and at what rate the some new ideas or innovations or technology spread in a social system like Pakistan. So there are basically five elements uh, which are very important uh, when we talk about the diffusion of innovation and adoption of innovations by the farmers. First of all is the uh, innovation itself. Then we have adopters, which are the farmers, end users, or uh, business enterprises, companies. And then we have channels or methodology of that how we are taking our innovation to the adopters. And then we have the social system. What is the social networking uh, happening in a particular era? So if we talk about the innovation, uh, there are some certain characteristics of innovation which are important. Uh, for example, what the farmers see that the first is the relative advantage. They compare the new idea, new technology, new concept with their existing. And if there's relative advantage, then the uh, time of innovation adoption is very uh, quick. Then comparative uh, compatibility with the social system. If the innovation is compatible with their existing practices, then again, it's uh, what the research says that its adoption rate is very high. Then trialability, as uh, one of the panelists said that the small farmer we have, the majority of small farmer, 90% of farmers in Pakistan are small uh, landholders, less than uh, mm -hmm. 12 acres of land. So they, they cannot take the risk to adopt the innovation in their whole uh, field. They, they would like to have a small trial where they can see the results. And the final is observability, where they can observe the uh, outcomes of the innovation. And again, uh, if we talk about the farmers, the farmers are again, they are not the homogeneous uh, entity that we say that if it is a innovation or any idea, it can be quickly distributed or adopted by the whole uh, community or in the whole social system. There are always some innovators within the farmers, which are normally uh, the three to five percent of the total population. They are progressive farmers educated. They can take this. They are more cosmopolite. They have very good uh, networking with the uh, research centers. Then there are early majority, which are about 13 to 15 percent of the farmers. And in fact, they are the opinion leader, they are the role model, because the research says that the farmers take the information from these opinion leaders. The, in, during the Green Revolution, when there, there was a more homogeneity uh, in the uh, social setup, the extension workers, uh, extension system worked very well. But now the farmers take more information uh, from their opinion leader. And then there are early majority, late majority and laggards, which are a very uh, who uh, don't adopt the <laughs> So these are, uh, and then there is the process of diffusion of innovation. Whenever we take some new idea to the farmers, first of all, it is a knowledge stage where the farmers start to perceive something that something new is going on, something new is happening, whether it is some precision agricultural technology, somebody is high efficiency, irrigation technology, or whatever. Then the next stage is they start to develop a positive or negative attitude, which is the second uh, stage of uh, adoption process. They start to seek more information. If they, if they see that it, their, uh, its innovation is relevant to their needs, and then the decision, they either reject or accept, and then implementation and confirmation. So these are different stages. So why some innovation, as we have seen that in Pakistan, there are many great technologies like many high efficiency uh, water uh, uh, irrigation technologies, which could not be adopted, <coughs> has been, have been adopted in clusters, but if we see the overall context, these new technology cannot be adopted, mainly because it lacks the background research 
about our social system, about the process of adoption of innovation, that how the farmers or end users adopt the innovation and about the innovation itself, what are the characteristics. So when we are talking about the adoption of these such uh, PA technologies in Pakistani context, we have to keep it within the reach of the farmer. And if it is more high tech, then as one of the panelists said that uh, there may be some spin-off companies, some startups who can ultimately uh, reach to the farmers. So technology is there already. It is not, uh, I mean, in world over. The personal and legal technology is already developed. We don't need to invent something new, but we have to make it compatible with our uh, socioeconomic context, with our uh, farming uh, community, and we have to make it a bit simpler so that our farmer can understand it. The, we don't see the, in Pakistan, the farming profession is now, is more like subsistence. The young generation, they are not uh, ready to adopt the farming profession. We are having, we are not uh, having our future farmers. They are not very much optimistic about the farming. But with this technological innovation, we can bring them back uh, to the main farming stream. So as I said that the Green Revolution was a success story, although it has many uh, negative consequences, but there are many positive aspects. But the success was because of a policy environment, a very strong policy backup and a very efficient extension and advocacy and outreach in the green technology, the green revolution. You know. We need a similar sort of uh, approach if we want to have the precision agriculture technology to be diffused and adopted in our uh, farming context. Otherwise, like uh, we are uh, far behind in the adoption of the biotechnology at the ground level. So I'm afraid uh, we may not be able to uh, harvest the full benefits of the precision agriculture technology. These are just my few thoughts and my few uh, missions. So if you have any question, then we are here to respond. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Babur, for uh, elaborating uh, the adoptivity perspective of precision agriculture and the bringing the social aspect that how these new technologies can be a part of our agriculture system and while looking the drawbacks and their benefits, uh, how we can uh, propagate these technologies for our agriculture and uh, particularly in times when we have low yields in every crop and we have the climate change challenges. Now, I like before uh, I like to uh, take questions uh, before going to the uh, uh, the audience here. I just start from the online idea audience. So, anyone who wants to. Uh, so, Dr. Tasib is here. So, uh, Dr. Tasib, you can you ask question? Uh, Gigi, uh, assalamu alaikum. Uh, uh, first of all, I would. Uh, am I audible there, please, Dr. Kashi? Yes, yes, you are audible. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, first of all, I would like to uh, really thank uh, wonderful talks by uh, Dr. Aitzaz, followed by Mr. and Mrs. Randava, and then Dr. Babar. Uh, I just will quickly introduce myself. I am uh, Dr. Tosifur Rahman. I am the project director uh, of a public sector development program project called Green AI. It is uh, a technological intervention of bringing precision agriculture. It's a pilot project that we are trying to do in Pakistan. So, so most of the talks were very inspiring and uh, reassuring at the same time. So I want to thank all the participants for sparing the time today and sharing their uh, wonderful experience with us today. I would also like to appreciate uh, uh, Dr. Abid uh, Sudari for uh, arranging this at a very pertinent moment uh, for us. It's, it's, it's very uh, well-timed, so I'm very happy with that. Uh, so I have a couple of uh, questions uh, from the uh, uh, respectable panel. 
uh, and starting. So I, I would uh, just state my questions and uh, then pr you can take your uh, time to answer them. I'll take the liberty of asking a couple. I hope that's not a problem uh, for the forum. Uh, so what, what one of the basic things that I would like to uh, uh, in, uh, get thoughts from uh, Mr. Gurjeet Randhawa is once he's showing uh, and once you've shared the your experiences in India, uh, uh, what what do you foresee uh, have been the most uh, formidable challenges with regards to large scale involvement of precision agriculture? Uh, because the Indian demographics are very uh, similar to what we have here, and uh, uh, so what have been the in, in particular once you have a technological uh, intervention at at a farm level and where the typical uh, technology adoption capacities are very very low, I, I'm I'm sure things are similar uh, demographically in India as well. So what, what I would like. Uh, Dr. Gujit to share some of his experiences, and uh, if it's not uh, directly, if he can share his thoughts, what what do what does he imagine those challenges are? My other question is for uh, Dr. Ethazaz. Uh, in particular, he mentioned a very critical area of uh, uh, soil exhaustion in Pakistan, and this is I can validate. We have survey data. Uh, most of Punjab, which is supposed to be fertile land, we have a lot of land exhaustion here. How does he see? Precision agriculture playing a role in pr providing the necessary respite to our soil, and uh, it, are the yields uh, good enough that we can actually just like uh, you were sharing that in uh, Canada you have a three-year rotation cycle. Uh, implementing that in in Pakistan, what challenges does he foresee uh, doing something like like that, and how technology can play a role in that? And just if also Mr. Gujit can also share uh, what has been their typical, uh, what in, in their experimentation, uh, the yield advantage gained for one or multiple crops that they've experienced. So just if you can share these thoughts on these uh, questions, I will be really uh, obliged. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll take one more question and then, uh, yes, sir, please, you response. Uh, referring to what uh, you can also introduce yourself. In, please introduce yourself. Uh, I'm uh, I am uh, I'm a new father. Okay. So taking the lead out of uh, what's been mentioned here regarding the software. Uh, so software can you you yes. take the mic so, so everyone online will listen you. So, taking the lead uh, out of uh, what's mentioned here about the application software, which is available to give them, I mean, push information to us. So, can we, in Pakistan, being individual, <coughs> can they benefit uh, from this software as well? Or it's, uh, I mean, is it already in use in Pakistan or what? So, the IBM one, uh, so if I may answer. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, so, thank you so much uh, uh, for uh, wonderful questions. Uh, I think uh, we'll start with the very first one. Uh, so, again, that's a really interesting one. The challenges with the adaptation of the technology, as uh, uh, there are many challenges, as uh, Dr. Babur mentioned, uh, taking uh, technology and then going to a farmer and asking them. Uh, uh, to have it, and uh, it's wonderful to see uh, new people joining the farming. Uh, I would say thank you because you are serving the community and uh, you are getting involved uh, with the technology. So that's also uh, really wonderful to see. Um, again, yes, uh, the conditions in India and Pakistan, they are pretty much same. Uh, the problem is if you just directly go to farmer, uh, the small farmer in particular, which are in majority in both countries, and ask them, okay, can you buy this equipment? Doesn't matter if it's expensive or not. It's like taking a risk, playing a lottery. Do, you do not know if it's gonna work or not. Uh, they won't be comfortable, right? That's, that's why I mentioned in my talk, it has to happen uh, at some level. Uh, it could be, say, a couple of villages can come together. It could be, say, one tessile can, can up together, some say, uh, like in India, we have corporate societies, uh, and in every casino you have multiple ones. 
So few villagers, they come under one corporate society and they buy tools and they lend out to our farmers for free. Um, so that's uh, government will have to put, make purchase or they can produce their own. And it's not an expensive equipment if they want to build their own. And then giving those to the farmers. Okay, the, the bigger ones uh, who have more land, they may not be comfortable waiting for their turn for those societies and they can buy their own. That's that's fine. But uh, to help out the smaller farmers, I think uh, uh, we need government in intervention. Okay, and then uh, the farmer, when they'll see, uh, most of them, they still go uh, by the word of mouth, right? So if, uh, say, I'm doing something and I see increase in the yield, I'll, I'll tell the other farmers and then they'll start adapting. So that's how the things are going to work on ground. Uh, and we, we have seen a significant increase. We have seen from 10 to 20 percent increase uh, uh, in the yield. Um, so that's significant. And we, we can't just focus on yield. We are also reducing a cost, uh, laboring cost. We are re uh, reducing the cost of herbicides. And uh, uh, with, uh, I would say, technological advancements in social media, most of people are becoming aware what they want to eat. Most of people are going towards organic farming. So say you want to buy a fruit and if you are paying the same price for organic one and uh, something that has chemical, you'll definitely go for organic one. Um, and uh, say as a parent, you will like to feed something healthy to your kids. Uh, so it's, that's going to be a trend if it's not there already. Uh, so it's there in cities, but even in villages, that's going to happen. If it does not happen now, it will happen in two years, three years, five years. Uh, but eventually it's going to happen. Same thing, uh, like if you think back, say 20 years ago, you'll say, okay, maybe we'll have cell phones in cities. Nobody's going to use in villages. But now everybody uses them. Okay, so they are going to go there. It uh, doesn't matter if you accept those things right now or not. Uh, second challenge is if you think from a commercial perspective, say from a company and I want to build these machines and provide service. Okay, there are challenges. Uh, you buy a machine, then you'll have to go to a farmer and I know how the social things work around here. So you'll go to one and say, you want it done. Uh, and then you'll have a negotiation and then you'll ask for a farmer and say, okay, come back again for the money. And you'll have to go there and spend time. You'll have to hire people to, to take those things. Uh, so that, that's another challenge. Uh, and it's, it's like in Canada, I would say we are at advantage that we have much bigger fields, thousands of acres. So you just deal with one farmer and you know your machine is working in that field and you'll make money just with one contract. And here it's just like collecting small bits of money. So it's from commercial angle, a service-based model, it's not uh, that uh, advantageous for, for the commercial company. Um, so, and uh, again, uh, so, uh, I would say, fortunately, I have also worked on uh, um, the thing uh, that uh, my missus uh, mentioned, uh, the tool. Uh, so I haven't worked on that tool. She has worked on that, but I have worked on the technology that he uses. It's a highly sophisticated system called Watson uh, that's developed by IBM. Uh, it has status basically big, many big servers, um, and it takes up the whole building, multi-story building. It's that much bigger. It's not just being used in agriculture. It's being used in uh, it's a health system and any other system. And uh, it's so fast that you can just feed multiple PDF documents, Word documents, any text, any images. Uh, you can even uh, feed the vid uh, audios, videos, uh, and natural languages. It'll, it can it understands syntax, semantics. It can make its own decision. Uh, so it can read all those millions of documents within a fraction of seconds, uh, then understand the semantics, syntax, and then make a decision out of it. So if you ask, uh, okay, you, you feed all the documents related to, uh, say, popular sites across Pakistan, and you ask uh, something about when this thing was built, it can precisely tell you this thing was built in this year, and you won't even notice the delay. And by that time, it's, it can take up, read all those documents. So it's so fast. Uh, that software, again, is commercial one. So you'll have to purchase it if you want to take IBM uh, data, but it's not hard to build. Okay, uh, so if, uh, say, agriculture universities here, they take up that challenge, it's not hard. 
uh, when the major component is machine learning, data science, these are open source libraries, zero cost. Uh, there are at least 15 satellites that provide you uh, the data that you need to build this kind of software, which are totally open source. So you can have free access to those data, uh, that those normalized uh, differential values, you can, you can get it for free. Um, and again, but uh, people from different domains will have to come up together, build this thing, but it's not uh, like if I have to code it, I can do it in say two days max. Uh, so it's, it's that simple. Uh, but then uh, bringing people together from other many disciplines, working on the technology and then delivering the implementation, advertising it, uh, like many old people, they'll still won't be comfortable in using smart devices. So instead of uh, forcing them to use internet, have something SMS-based system so they can still read text or somehow, also not just be in English, but uh, do it in their local, your local languages, uh, that can be effective. So those things, they can be built. Again, th that's a basically subscription-based uh, uh, system. And I, if I'm uh, not uh, wrong, uh, the free things are only say weather alerts uh, and few other basic alerts, but if you need uh, personalized things like uh, fertilizer plan uh, or irrigation plan for your system, crop detection, yield thing, add on things, they basically, as you add on to any subscription based model, you'll pay more. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Dr. Ezzas, uh, there was. Yeah, I have to go. Thank you. I just want to add one more thing to Dr. Gurjit's. Uh, uh, comment there. One thing I think uh, the in uh, adoption of the technology is uh, that promoting the technology, which I think is lacking in uh, in this part of the world. That uh, I've seen in North America, we have about four field days, our farmer meetings, and uh, when we call those farmer meetings, everybody is invited. Not only big farmers, anybody who is farming, they are invited. We, as researchers, get invited. We demonstrate the technology in front of farmers. Then they kind of seeing is believing. So then they kind of see, okay, this is the value, how much this we save, and uh, how it's going to work. And then obviously we can have uh, have a debate on. So I think uh, there need to be some level of uh, integration with the extension universities, and also maybe the district administration that promoting those agriculture shows, whether that is a machinery show, that is a field show, mm -hmm. showcasing those trials, especially technological trials, where farmers can see that there is an advantage. So uh, so that's uh, one thing which and, I uh, If I may add just a little thing, like my opinion is, again, uh, uh, I agree with Dr. Hetsar said, but uh, what our social circle is, I think it would be really hard to invite farmers to the agriculture universities from the villages. Uh, why do not we take the technology to them? No, uh, field, yeah. days, field days are yeah. always at a farm, yeah. like which is somewhere in the middle. The as a university yeah. go there, they as a farmer come there and it's more like a yeah. lay language discussion and uh, demonstration and whatnot. Yeah, so nothing uh, kind of too formal where they feel distant, but uh, just to get involved with them as a community member. Yeah. And for example, the technology I mentioned, uh, now we are implementing at uh, over 30,000 hectare in Prince Edward Island. It took me over seven years. And I've been going to field days, making the presentation. Now the credibility is built. I don't need to justify anything. And there is a credibility. The provincial government listens to me, growers listens to me. And I have to admit, uh, my father doesn't listen to me, and he is a farmer. <laughs> so he, he thinks, uh, uh, and I'm going to go to the house, and I'm going to go to the And to answer the second question about the soil exertion, yes, that is an issue. And I think the, the solution is biocircular economy. We are promoting biosolids. And putting those biosolids, whether that is a food waste, pyrolyze that into a carbon rich char or biochar, and uh, incorporating that into the soil on a regular basis. And also, when I was a kid, uh, we used to use a uh, lot of animal dung in our fields. 
but that practice is gone now. So that part of that was to provide nutrient and uh, organic matter. And so the same way uh, we have been using some practices where we are using biochar, municipal waste, waste in, the, in our soils and PEI to improve organic matter and soil exertion. And on top of that, uh, I think there needs to be at some level of combination of crops because uh, in Pakistan, we are stuck with traditional crops. If we are growing sugarcane, that's a year crop. And then it's sugarcane belt. So there has to be some level of, I know we cannot afford just grasses because there is a livelihood depending on that. Maybe, maybe beans or any leguminous crops where, where there is still a profit which they can sell, but cannot be, cannot be say rice or wheat year to year. So there need to be some level of rotation so that there is some level of breathing space for the soil to build and uh, and, uh, and uh, build a structure in organic matter and be strong enough and healthy to produce more. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, please introduce yourself and then have a shot. Sure. Assalamualaikum. My name is Muin Bartley. So I'm director of the corporate training department of Ikra University. <laughs> and we have, uh, we are uh, trying to do farmers training, uh, which is something new because usually uh, this is not considered part of corporate training. So we have a particular, so we, we, start, we thought we focused with, uh, start with data crops and then start with wheat. And uh, we are planning a training right now uh, where our approach is that we develop the profile of a farm, which would be based on three components. So th that would be soil, uh, that would be climate, and the water situation. And then once you have this profile, then you plan your whole farming strategy uh, in terms of inputs, in terms of methods, uh, the, the farming plan. So we're, we're trying to uh, use this approach. That, that's just a quick introduction. I had a couple of questions. One was, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Tadas, you, you talked about feeding the best athletes, right? So I was thinking of, uh, let's say you have a team, and if you uh, use the, the strategy of feeding the best athletes, then you'd have some star performers, but you'll have a losing team. So um, uh, is there a danger that by, by just precisely uh, looking at the productive parts of the field and is just focusing on that and getting the best out of that, you may um, lose the opportunity of having an overall productive field by not uh, fixing and uh, having uh, remed remedying uh, the weaknesses of the, the weaker parts of the field. So that's one question. The other related, related question is that, is there a, uh, you know, there may be weaker parts of the field, but if you do a cost-benefit analysis, that it still may be worthwhile using that. You still may make a profit. So is, is that done? So that's the second thing. And then for uh, uh, Dr. Tarandi, uh, there's this question uh, regarding your, uh, you know, the, the program that you mentioned. And I was thinking of, uh, you know, like uh, social media or Facebook, uh, uh, they, you know, you build the system and then you monetize it later. You change the behavior and then you monetize it later. So is it possible that this uh, system that you shared, uh, this could be made available, let's say, free to farmers in Pakistan? I don't know if, uh, whether IBM does it or some startup comes in and, uh -huh. and does it. But the, the idea is that so you bring about the behavioral change. And then um, so many uh, will be using this this, this possible, and there'll be so, so much data would be collected as a part of this. And there could be some other ways, rather than paying a fee upfront to use the system, there could be another way to earn from, from this technology. Yeah, maybe. Uh, one more question uh, from youngsters. Urdu <laughs> Yes. 
Assalamualaikum. Uh, my name is Atik Parahman. I'm from uh, Ikra University Corporate Training Center, Internees. Uh, my question is, ke, how the local or medium farmers dealing with the rising cost of technological opportunities? If I know, they know. They know financial difficulty day by day. So, if I... Thank you. Thank you. One minute. बहुत शुक्रिया आपने लैंग्वेज टेक्निक मैंने एक बेसिकली एक थॉट यहां पर दे दिया इस पर रिस्पेक्टेड फोरम पर जो इस पूरी डिबेट अभी तक कोने पर आ जाए ताकि स्पीकर हद तक उसके ऊपर बहुत बहुत बात की गई जैसे कास्ट बेनिफिट एनालिसिस की बात आ गई ऑनलाइन पार्टिसिपेंट्स फॉर एग्जांपल कास्ट बेनिफिट एनालिसिस के ऊपर बात की गई या क्रॉपिंग पैटर्न के ऊपर या बिहेवियर के ऊपर या जिस तरह से ग्रीन रेवोल्यूशन के ऊपर तो एक थॉट है इसमें जो मैं समझता हूँ बड़ा इम्पोर्टेंट है खसूस जो हमारे दोस्त कनाडा से हैं शायद इसकी अहमियत को समझें मेरा नाम डॉक्टर माजिद है मैं पीएचडी हूँ एंथ्रोपोलॉजी में और मैं एंथ्रोपोलॉजी डेवलपमेंट स्टडीज का पार्ट हूँ पहली यूनिवर्सिटी इस्लामाबाद में सो हमारा जो ट्रेडिशनल पैटर्न है आपने जो अपनी पीपीटीज दिखाई है उसमें क्रॉप बड़ी लाइन में बड़ी स्मूथ है और बीच में तो हम ये देखते हैं कि 12 एकड़ वाले जो हमारे जमींदार हैं बहुत ज्यादा है लेकिन दो चार छह एकड़ वाले हमारे इलाके में बड़े जमींदार कच्चे ढलते हैं और दो तीन एकड़ वाले तो बहुत सारे हैं अब उसमें मसला ये है कि दो चार एकड़ वाला छह एकड़ वाला वो क्या करता है जी ट्रैक्टर के दो राउंड लगाता है उसके बाद छठा मारता है उसके बाद एक राउंड अब उसमें यह टेक्नोलॉजी कहां पर अब ये बेसिकली टेक्नोलॉजी इंट्रोड्यूस कराने से पहले वहां के बिहेवियर पैटर्न इकोनॉमिक कंडीशंस आपने कहा कि जमीन को रेस्ट देना चाहिए हमें भी रेस्ट चाहिए होता है लेकिन वहां पर इकोनॉमिक पैटर्न ये है कि जमीन से कुछ आएगा तो हम खाएंगे और अगर कोई सीजन हम उसको छोड़ देते हैं तो विल बी टेकिंग केयर फॉर दैट थिंग इसके लिए बिफोर लॉन्चिंग टेक्नोलॉजी बाद में टेक्नोलॉजी लेकर जाए और उसमें कल्चर लैग आ जाए किसी किस्म का भी कोई लैग आ जाता है उस एक्सेप्टेंस से पहले मेरा ख्याल ये है कि वी नीड एथनोग्राफर्स We need anthropologists who are going and spending time. Like here, there are many respected people who are working in different fields. So basically, anthropology, systematic, scientific studies, and all these things. So basically, anthropology, systematic, scientific study of human being, what they need actually. So that need, we sit here and decide on the need. We decide on the need, we take it, we take it. Lack of because of accept thing, so the whole the whole model is gone. So better, my opinion is that. अब जो भी गवर्नमेंट ऑफ पाकिस्तान की तरफ से या सूबों की तरफ से जो भी रिस्पेक्टेबल इदारे हैं काम कर रहे हैं तो लोगों के बिहेवियर सोशो कल्चरल इकोनॉमिक कंडीशंस और पर्टिकुलरली जो जैसे आपने कहा मुंडिया एक गला इधर ही चल दिया उधर ही चल दिया बिल्कुल ऐसा ही है अभी एक मैं थोड़ा सा आपको टाइम थोड़ा ज्यादा मैं ले रहा हूँ क्योंकि मेरे लिए ये ज्यादा इंपॉर्टेंट है एज एंथ्रोपोलॉजिस्ट की पहले लोगों को समझा जाए उनकी डिमांड को समझा जाए फिर उसके मुताबिक टेक्नोलॉजी और ये चीजें इंट्रोड्यूस कराई जाए अब फॉर एग्जांपल हमारा जो इलाका है मैं मुजफ्फरगढ़ से बिलोंग करता हूँ जनूबी पंजाब वहां पर जो 60 साल 50 साल की ज्यादा उम्र के लोग हैं उनको मोबाइल ऐप टेक्नोलॉजी नहीं जाती एंड दे आर द डिसीजन मेकर ऑफ ईच एंड एवरी इन द सेकेंड टू दैट जो मेरी जनरेशन के लोग हैं जो अभी डिसीजन मेकिंग के प्रोसेस में है जो 40 से 50 साल के हैं दे लो मोबाइल है लेकिन इकोनॉमिक लिमिटेशन कंडीशन की वजह से कि अगर आपने रीजन लगाना मिसाल के तौर पर मकई की काश्त अपर पंजाब में जाए आपको खेलों में नजर आए हमारे यहाँ जाए ट्रैक्टर दो चक्कर लगाए फिर छठ और उसके बाद फिर पानी दे उसको अपनी मर्जी है कोई पौधा किधर जा रहा है कोई किधर जा रहा है तो इसको एक पॉलिसी मेकिंग लेवल पर बेसिक रिसर्च एथनोग्राफी एंड देन आई थिंक देर शुड बी दिस टेक्नोलॉजी एंड थैंक यू थैंक यू क्विकली यू कैन रिस्पॉन्ड टू द क्वेश्चंस एंड देन वी रिक्वेस्ट डॉक्टर स्टीफन थैंक यू आई यू रोज वेलविल देन सी हाजी थैंक यू जी सो इफ आई मे आस आई मे टेक द लास्ट क्वेश्चन फर्स्ट सो again uh, very relevant points and i i completely agree uh, because uh, whenever we design anything we should think about stakeholders right so whoever are going to use the technology uh, the robot i showed definitely it's uh, the winning tools uh, they will be dependent on the crop 
and uh, they need crop to be sown in uh, some particular fashion and that, that's part and part of the technology. We can make the design a bit flexible. Again, I can't say that you can have that K2C sort of that's again it's, it's a really computationally it's going to be really challenging task uh, but we can improve but we can't uh, guarantee the same kind of uh, results uh did you see rotation is difficult because uh, you, you need that circle of income you can't just uh, stay there and I'm not asking the government for charity, and I'm not asking the government to free the Rishtan Paise they the timely. What you can do is uh, people can come up together, ask the government that let's, let's make markets uh, for the crops. On to see Dalan di Gal Kerge. Consumption tano export kar di zrutani local hi consumption kini hai. Why we import such things? Tike, asi, uh, on, as farmer, you grow it. You go to the market, you know, you middle man and sell it and you can't get it. 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 So, oh, oh, jira cheese hai, oh, sanu teaker and these rurat hai. Why we don't come up together ek, to see a you know, profitable model or oh, self, self sustainable model? Ban sakda. To see come up together, uh, karoke asi a pelake di ek bistek di ja ek kush jenemi kush elaka hai. Ke, ਅਸੀਂ ਜੇ ਦਾਲਾਂ ਬੀਜਣੀਆਂ ਨੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਅਸੀਂ ਆਪ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਕਿੰਨਾ ਕੋਖਾ ਕੰਮ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਸਾਫ਼ ਕਰਨਾ ਕਿੰਨੀ ਉਹ ਕੰਪੈਟੀਵਲੀ ਸੌਖੀ ਫਸਲ ਹੈ ਜਿਹਦੇ ਉੱਤੇ ਤੁਹਾਡਾ ਓਵਰਆਲ ਖਰਚਾ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਕੈਮੀਕਲਸ ਦਾ ਜਾਂ ਹੋਰ ਇਹ ਚੀਜ਼ਾਂ ਘੱਟ ਨੇ ਉਹਦਾ ਡਿਊਰੇਸ਼ਨ ਘੱਟ ਹੈ ਛੋਟਾ ਹੈ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਸਾਫ਼ ਕਰਕੇ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਪੈਕੇਜਿੰਗ ਆਪ ਕਰਕੇ ਆਪਣੀ ਲੋਕਲ ਕਮਿਊਨਿਟੀ ਨੂੰ ਸਰਵ ਕਰੀਏ ਉਸ ਤੋਂ ਬਾਅਦ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਵਰਤੀ ਹੈ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਆਪਾਂ ਐਕਸਪੋਰਟ ਕਰੀਏ ਉਸ ਤੋਂ ਬਾਅਦ ਸਟਾਰਟਿੰਗ ਦੇ ਉੱਤੇ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਯੂ ਕੈਨ ਹਾਇਰ ਫਿਊ ਪੀਪਲ ਹੂ ਆਰ ਗੋਨ ਟੂ ਮੈਨੇਜ ਯੂ ਯੂ ਆਰ ਗੋਇੰਗ ਟੂ ਬਾਈ ਫਿਊ ਇਕਵਿਪਮੈਂਟ ਆਫਟਰ ਦੈਟ ਦੈਟ ਮਾਡਲ ਇਜ਼ ਗੋਨ ਰਿਟਰਨ ਗਿਵ ਯੂ ਦ ਰਿਟਰਨ ਇਨ 1 ਈਅਰ ਔਰ ਮੈਕਸਿਮਮ 2 ਐਂਡ ਆਫਟਰ ਦੈਟ ਯੂ ਕੈਨ ਗਰੋ ਅਪ ਯੂ ਕੈਨ ਹਾਇਰ ਫਿਊ ਪੀਪਲ ਇਨ देयर ਜਿਨ੍ਹਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਪੇ ਵੀ ਕਰੋ ਸੈਲਰੀਡ ਐਮਪਲੋਈ ਵੀ ਹੋਣ ਬਟ ਉਹ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਐਡਵਰਟਾਈਜ਼ ਕਰਨ ਇੱਕ ਬ੍ਰਾਂਡ ਬਣੇ ਇੱਕ ਲੋਕਲ ਬ੍ਰਾਂਡ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਬਣਾਓ ਕਿ ਠੀਕ ਹੈ ਕਿ ਦਿਸ ਇਜ਼ ਵਟ ਐਵਰ ਇਸਲਾਮਾਬਾਦ ਦਾ ਫੈਸਲਾਬਾਦ ਹੈ ਇਥੋਂ ਦਾਲਾਂ ਜਿਹੜੀਆਂ ਨੇ ਮਸ਼ਹੂਰ ਨੇ ਠੀਕ ਹੈ ਦ ਮਾਰਕ ਪ੍ਰੋਬਲਮ ਫਾਰ ਫਾਰ ਦ ਫਾਰਮਰ ਇਜ਼ ਦੇ ਆਰ ਰੈਡੀ ਫਾਰ ਰੋਟੇਸ਼ਨ ਦੇ ਡੂ ਨਾਟ ਹੈਵ ਮਾਰਕੀਟਿੰਗ ਐਂਡ ਉਹ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਗੈਪ ਹੈ ਇਟਸ ਨਾਟ ਗੋਨਾ ਫਿਲ ਅਪ ਕੇ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਗਵਰਨਮੈਂਟ ਨੂੰ ਕਹੋ ਐਂਡ ਦੈਨ ਵਿਲ ਸੈਲ ਓਕੇ ਵਿਲ ਗਿਵ ਯੂ ਦ ਐਮ ਆਰ ਪੀ ਔਨ ਥੈਟ ਔਰ ਵਿਲ ਪਿਕ ਇਟ ਅਪ ਬਟ ਦੋਸ ਆਰ ਜਸਟ ਆਈ ਵਿਲ ਸੇ ਫਾਲਸ ਪ੍ਰੋਮਿਸਸ ਦੇ ਆਰ ਨਾਟ ਗੋਨਾ ਹੈਪਨ ਸੋ ਉਹ ਵਾਲੀ ਚੀਜ਼ ਨੂੰ ਟੈਕਲ ਕੀਤਾ ਜਾ ਸਕਦਾ ਹੈ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਤੁਸੀਂ ਰੋਬੋਟਸ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਕੀਤੀ ਦੈਟ ਇਜ਼ ਨਾਟ ਦੈਟਸ ਨਾਟ ਦ ਓਨਲੀ ਪਾਰਟ ਆਫ ਪ੍ਰੋਸੀਜਨ ਐਗਰੀਕਲਚਰ ਡਾਕਟਰ ਸਾਹਿਬ ਨੇ ਜਿਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਗੱਲ ਕੀਤੀ ਸੀ ਕਿ ਇੱਕ ਜੀਨੋਮਿਕਸ ਸੌਰੀ ਆਈ ਕੈਨ ਐਕਸਪਲੇਨ ਯੂ ਲੇਟਰ ਇਫ ਇਫ ਆਮ ਸਪੀਕਿੰਗ ਇਨ ਦਾ ਲੋਕਲ ਲੈਂਗੁਏਜ ਸੋ ਹੁਣ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਆਪਾਂ ਜੀਨੋਮਿਕਸ ਦੀ ਗੱਲ ਕਰਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਠੀਕ ਹੈ ਹੁਣ ਮੈਂ ਸਵੇਰ ਦੀ ਟਾਕਸ ਵੀ ਗੱਲ ਕਰ ਰਿਹਾ ਸੀਗਾ ਕਿ ਅਸੀਂ ਹੁਣ ਨਾਰਥ ਅਮਰੀਕਾ ਚ ਦੇਖਦੇ ਹਾਂ ਫਸਲ ਛਲੀਆਂ ਦੇ ਟੰਡ ਸਾਰੀ ਇੱਕ ਜਗ੍ਹਾ ਤੇ ਛਲੀਆਂ ਲੱਗਦੀਆਂ ਨੇ ਠੀਕ ਹੈ ਆਟੋਮੈਟਿਕ ਮਸ਼ੀਨ ਨੇ ਉੱਥੇ ਬਲੇਡ ਸੈੱਟ ਕਰਕੇ ਕੱਟ ਦੇਣੀਆਂ ਨੇ ਕੀ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਹੁਣ ਯੀਲਡ ਕਰਨਾ ਜਾਂ ਕ੍ਰੋਪ ਦਾ ਫਰੂਟ ਦਾ ਸਾਈਜ਼ ਵਧਣਾ ਹੈ ਜਾਂ ਇੱਕ ਡੰਡੇ ਨੂੰ ਜ਼ਿਆਦਾ ਫਲੀਆਂ ਲੱਗਣੀਆਂ ਨੇ ਉਹ ਕੀ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਜੀਨ ਐਡਿਟਿੰਗ ਹੈ ਫੈਸਲਾਬਾਦ ਯੂਨੀਵਰਸਿਟੀ ਚ ਮੈਂ ਲੈਬਸ ਦੇਖਿਆ ਉਹ ਕੰਮ ਕਰ ਰਹੇ ਨੇ ਉਹਦੇ ਤੇ ਹੋ ਰਿਹਾ ਹੈ ਠੀਕ ਹੈ ਬਟ ਉਹ ਉਹੀ ਚੀਜ਼ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਸੀਡ ਨੂੰ ਕਿਸਾਨਾਂ ਤੱਕ ਪਹੁੰਚਾਉਣ ਦੀ ਜ਼ਿੰਮੇਵਾਰੀ ਕਿ ਉਹ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਐਟ ਲੀਸਟ ਉਸ ਤੇ ਰੇਟ ਦੇ ਉੱਤੇ ਜਦ ਤੱਕ ਬਾਕੀ ਮਿਲ ਰਿਹਾ ਹੈ ਜਾਂ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਅਵੇਲੇਬਿਲਟੀ ਉਹ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਗੈਪ ਖਤਮ ਕਰਨ ਦਾ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਨੂੰ ਦੱਸਣ ਦਾ ਕਿ ਆ ਚੀਜ਼ ਤੁਹਾਡੇ ਲਈ ਬੈਟਰ ਹੈ ਇਹਨੇ ਤੁਹਾਨੂੰ ਜ਼ਿਆਦਾ
ਜੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਕੁਝ ਵੀ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਰਦੇ ਤੇ 0% ਪ੍ਰੋਗਰੈਸ ਹੈ ਇਫ ਵੀ ਕੈਨ ਮੇਕ 5% ਪ੍ਰੋਗਰੈਸ ਆਲ ਬੀ ਹੈਪੀ ਰਾਦਰ ਥੈਨ ਜਸਟ ਸਿਟਿੰਗ ਐਂਡ ਵੇਟਿੰਗ ਸੋ ਉਹ ਦਾ ਇਹ ਮੇਰੀ ਅਪਰੋਚ ਹੈ ਐਂਡ ਅਗੇਨ ਆਈ ਹੈਵ ਨਾਟ ਬਿਲਕੁਲ ਅੱਛੀ ਹੈ ਹਾਂਜੀ ਅਭੀ ਮਾਡਲ ਜੋ ਵੀ ਡਾਕਟਰ ਸਟੈਫਨ ਦੇ ਕਮੈਂਟ ਹੈ ਹਾਂਜੀ ਐਗਰੀ ਐਗਰੀ ਹਾਂਜੀ ਬਾਕੀ ਕੁਐਸਚਨਸ ਡਾਕਟਰ ਸਟੈਫਨ ਕੋ ਯੈਸ so thank thank you very much uh, i i um got the invitation to come it was yesterday and when the invitation came in the inbox um i knew i had to come and uh, mm-hmm. number one uh, agriculture is really important number two technology for us as a species we're completely dependent on it uh, as a uh, for our survival we have since uh, the time immemorial so this is this is really important i'm steven mangrel i look after rural development and economic cooperation at the eu delegation here to pakistan and um, i'm really grateful for being here and thank you for extending the, the invitation i listened very carefully to your uh, interventions and uh, before i say anything else i just like to say uh, i've noticed a number of ladies in the room and i think this is really very encouraging because even from the culture of country where i come from agriculture is a male dominated activity and uh, we have few females in agriculture uh, uh, apart from farmers daughters so it's always good to see uh, ladies also in this whole area not just in, in farming itself but i i hope also in the research extension etc across the board so that's that's really that's really positive precision agriculture we have it in the european union we have it and it's driven mainly by our high level our our high overhead costs that we have it's really driven by production costs and in addition to the production costs it's also driven by policy and uh, particularly in respect to um, environmental protection uh, issues and regulations that we have which are becoming ever more stringent uh, and i speak particularly in regards to pesticide application where uh, a lot of uh, pesticides that we've had on the market for many years have been uh, deregulated and taken on become illegal so we are looking for alternative ways to um, get rid of weeds and get rid of pests and diseases and of course to offer our opportunities and uh, offer production as intensively as we possibly can but you know agriculture also in the european union is very bizarre too i mean it's very uh, it's very um it varies a lot uh, we don't have well, it depends where you are again the country where i come from up until about 40 or 50 years ago farms are very small and fragmented due mainly to uh, uh the uh, outdated inheritance policy where farms were passed from uh father to not the eldest son but to all the sons and so they all got their piece yeah. so as the generations passed the farms got smaller so my country was you know characterized so the agriculture by tiny tiny field sizes which persisted up largely to the 1970s but that has been reversed in more recent decades and we have larger fields but we don't have the same type scale of agriculture that you have across the prairies in Canada or in the parts of the west of Australia or the parts of Australia or of course the United States Midwest so you know so you you have a you have a uh, an advance in that sense okay you're from Prince Edward Island <laughs> working there it's, it's a slightly slightly different but basically it's it's not relatively new for us but it's still it's it's in its uptake adaptation in many ways except it under glass and when we say under glass we mean in terms of protected crops for like tomato production in in, in Netherlands for example but they do start using um uh, stuff of this nature so this is this is interesting now, here in Pakistan the, the delegation the EU delegation uh, we're very focused uh, working with our Pakistani partners a uh, whole range of different pakistani stakeholders and of course the government of pakistan and regional administrations uh, from villages down to sindh etc we were focused primarily on um on food security against the very challenging environmental conditions that we we face here particularly for some of the, your most vulnerable communities in villages down and, 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 and sindh as well uh and we do know that basically much of your production here again is very small scale a lot of there's no land ownership for many people and uh, the whole air whole issue of who owns land and how land is is structured and farmed paid for etc is very complicated so 
there are issues to uptake and adoption of this type of technology, particularly in these particular areas. Of course, agriculture is very, very labor intensive in that sense. So it does provide work. It does provide income at, at household level. Uh, and that's something which I guess also has to be balanced as well in a socioeconomic context. But um, we do always welcome anything that will bring or promote more sustainable production. This is absolutely fundamental. That with fewer inputs and less environmental impacts. So this is something which, again, yes, on the other hand, we're, we're, we, we, we do, uh, we do uh, would promote and welcome very much. Um, so really, I guess some of those things or some of those points that I raised, which are rather contradictory, um, I'm just interested in what is the real prospect for this type of technology here in Pakistan, which agriculture would be for the cash crops in terms of cotton and sugar cane, for example, as opposed to sustainable production of, of vegetables and things of that nature. And what are the challenges really to be overcome and really within what type of time frame would we expect to see this type of technology on the ground? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, just uh, briefly, uh, there's some online questions uh, from say, uh, Faisal Coker that uh, there was uh, looking for some smart uh, IT service, enabled services in Pakistan that are uh, particularly available with the affected areas. Uh, and also a question from Dr. Mr. Hamad uh, Imran Shaddad about that agri tech uh, uh, technology firms have very uh, Good solutions and uh, software for the uh, for for their services, but they, they, and it's look impressive when uh, when academia talk about those uh, solutions. But when it goes to the field, it becomes fail. So what are the reason behind it? So I like uh, uh, Dr. Babur if they can give us some. There is a question about apps where they have asked uh, for if we can provide them some names of the apps that they can use. They can use for. Uh, for the concluding remarks concluding remarks from all these are the questions and so i missed the question i was busy yes the question is about that what the it enabled services available in pakistan and particularly for the flood affected areas how by agri tech companies have very wonderful solutions and academia talk about very wonderful solution but when it goes to the field it becomes fair so that's yeah it. that's uh, what i talk about in my concluding remarks there are some problem background research is lacking the uh, ground realities are not being understood uh, very well the uh, problem with the uh, innovation itself the lack of understanding of uh, farmers categories so these are, i have uh, i think already uh, responded to these and about the uh, IT related solution, mostly we are relying on the applications, mobile apps. There are some apps uh, which have been developed uh, in our university. These are mostly the uh, question and answer type of interactive apps, or there are some uh, uh, attempts are being made to develop app based on the AI, uh, like uh, the identification of uh, particular pests and uh, from the crops and the app with itself. Uh, identify that what type of pest is it, is it, and then give its uh, possible uh, controlling uh, mechanism. So uh, still, uh, we are on these uh, apps, are they uh, available? Uh, one of the questions which remained unanswered about uh, this young man that uh, there are financial constraints, but uh, still uh, farmers uh, are being, yes, it's very right that farming is now not a very much profitable uh, business in Pakistan, keeping in view the reduction in the uh, land holding. But the research says that if we take uh, farming household, the farming agriculture is now no more a major livelihood strategies for most of the farming household. They are dependent on multiple sources of income like remittances, small business, government job, and farming is just one uh, maybe secondary or tertiary sort of livelihood strategy. And they are still continuing because of sort of the pride, because the Javi farmer take the farming as pride. They don't want to uh, totally uh, discard it. So these are uh, some of my points.
Oh, yeah, I would say, uh, first of all, uh, regarding uh, getting the field size smaller and smaller, uh, as uh, uh, mentioned by a uh, few people here, yes, uh, that's a problem. And uh, uh, when I look at how the model changed a few decades ago in North America, and uh, we went for corporate farming um, that has its own problems, uh, and I don't like that, but uh, I, I don't see any other solution. Uh, so eventually it may happen uh, uh, that uh, people will, because people are opting out of agriculture because it's not profitable anymore and uh, bringing on those small fields and uh, or just one bigger corporate, they can, I don't know, uh, lease up, uh, they can take those on lease and bring in them that land. <laughs> uh, some benefits are would be easier to manage and uh, then you can handle those uh, bigger farms. But as you said, it's, uh, that's, social problem of pride and uh, nobody wants to sell their land <laughs> right and nobody will be uh, happy to lease those uh, uh, and again as uh, uh, were mentioned uh, a few times here uh, that we need to understand stakeholders i agree uh, to go to them uh, take their feedback and build solutions based on that uh, there was a question uh, from uh, the online uh, audience that uh, why the things look really nice uh, in academia and research and uh, uh, they kind of fail or they do not reach out to the farmer. I would say uh, everybody has to do their role. Okay, so if uh, they are looking nice to you in academia, that means uh, scientists are working, researchers are working, they are doing their job. Uh, the government has to pitch in, uh, the officers at different levels, the policy makers, they will have to pitch in. Uh, and uh, to take that thing to the field, uh, to talk to the farmers, change their mindset, uh, encourage them, uh, spend time on advertising those new solutions, uh, then uh, take their viewpoint, understand them and uh, bringing their viewpoint. And it's like, I don't see technology as something that you develop and enforce on people. And I don't think you can just, uh, doesn't matter how uh, broad your literature review is or how deep your literature review is, there are always going to be some lacks. So it should be uh, looked at as an, iterative process where you'll give something out and then you'll take the feedback, you you improve uh, the design, uh, uh, you take into account uh, social uh, impacts, uh, whatever, economic, financial, uh, all those things, uh, then improve the design, uh, satisfy the needs, I would say the most pressing needs first and then keep on uh, evolving that design. So that's uh, how we can look in, uh, at these things. But again, uh, the effort should be made at multiple places, at the university level, at the government level, at the personal level. Um, so we need to think as a society because the problem is not just increasing somebody's income. It's much uh, bigger when we think about food security. Uh, like we are getting more mouths to feed. The population is increasing and uh, we are not producing that much food. Uh, we are still fortunate we are getting uh, uh, good meals, uh, but uh, the situation is not the same around the globe. Uh, and we shouldn't just think about it as a kind of personal benefit, but it is a service to the society. Uh, and uh, that's uh, how I think about it. And uh, I'll uh, let uh, Dr. Zaz uh, talk about more things. Thank, Thank you. you. I just want to make a few comments and uh, try to answer a few questions. Any technology or any business or any entrepreneurship that run around socioeconomics? we need to take into account and we need to care about those socioeconomic challenges before we propose any solution. And just to give a, a, a small example in Pakistani context. So if we wanna implement precision agriculture in Pakistan, that has to be a phased approach. And when I say phased approach, uh, for example, when I was a kid going to university, our harvester were not efficient. They were losing about 20%. And that today, it's still the same. We are losing about 20% right in the field. Why can't we pick that up? So that if we pick that up, we secure the food, uh, food security, we improve the food security, we make more profit for the grower because he or she is not losing 10, 15 to 20% right in the field. Same thing, we are going with, uh, with the broadcasting, chatta. That's how we are cultivating our seed. Why can't we use the drill? And there is a proven literature that it improves the yield by 10 to 
So that's not a rocket science. There is no sensor involved in that. It's just simple drill. You raise it by 10 to 15%. So those are some simple things which we can apply. And uh, I even I learned a few days ago in uh, arid agriculture that the losses are still around 20%. And I was shocked and surprised that uh, when I left the country 15 years ago, it was the same story. And after 15 years, I hear the same story. So where we are. So now, and it's like there are, and how it works is that we buy scrap from overseas and turn those into the harvesters, which are not being used in the West or where they came from, but we try to use them and, and also deteriorate the quality of the green and all that. So, so if the government and the policy is there, like a union council has two harvesters with a toolkit that you can harvest rice and wheat, and then everybody is paying rent or whatnot, and those are efficient machine. And if we reduce that losses by 5%, that's huge. So I think that's the phased approach. So now with the, when uh, there was a question about why technology fail in the field. So to me, working 10, 15 years in North America, I always work with the groups and uh, I encounter those issues as we go. So I don't develop work in silo, develop something with no interaction with the problem and then kind of make my own problem and publish the research and whatnot. So when you're working with the growers, you are interacting with them, you're talking to them, what are their issues, what evolution and stages a disease take or weed take and what is there? Because to me, the growers are experienced, they are scientists. They have a lot of knowledge behind. And then if you interact with them, you kind of add on to your development, you make it better. So that's what it is missing here in Pakistan. And uh, like, uh, I, and I gave you a recent example, two of my grad students, they joined a few weeks ago in Canada for a master degree. And we were in the field digging potatoes and collecting the data and I was carrying the samples. And the students literally asked me that, sir, we were not expecting that you will be doing this job, carrying the samples running around with us within the field and making yourself dirty and whatnot. So all, all I'm trying to see, that is the interaction. This is how you kind of get to know what's going on. So, and one last thing about the, and crop diversification. So I know we cannot afford to leave the land vacant for three years, rotation. So the crop diversification is the answer. Like, and the government has to make some level of policy or whatnot that, yes, you go with the beans, you go with the, like, uh, barley or whatever. So it can't be, so it is still a money business. It is still profitable, but there is a market for it out there. One last comment uh, about the, about the feeding your best athletes. So that works for us in Prince Edward Island because we get a lot of erosion issues. And when I say erosion, top half meter is gone after the snow melt. So now we know right at the start of the, after doing the thermal imagery that soil, whatever we do, this part of the field is only going to lose and lose by 30%. And this productive part is going to cover for this. And at the end of the day, we are hardly break even. So then it is per hour cost. Like if I'm making $15 an hour and I know I'm spending $100 during the season and I know I'm not gonna make, what's the point? Why I am even investing my energy in that? So when I say feeding your best athlete, so that works if you are dealing with erosion issues, but if the, uh, you don't have erosion, still you need to manage the variability and apply inputs to make it uniform and kind of improve your productivity. Those are my final thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so the question about this kind of model, so I'm not sure what is working in the Pakistan, but as Dr. Gurjeet said, we can make by ourselves the machine learning model so that, uh, so that needs to be implemented by your industry. So I'm not sure if there is anything free available. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, we so, can easily make it. Yeah, so as uh, somebody uh, said, uh, can I, I think you mentioned that what, uh, if I don't think they will, 
they are corporate and they need to make money is plainly the same, uh, like it's a simple statement. Uh, and uh, IBM, uh, if I talk about just IBM, uh, they have been the leaders uh, in uh, uh, putting out new systems, uh, be it uh, uh, AI, be it uh, cloud computing, anything. So their products, they came to the market, very, uh, they are among the very first few. So they, they set a trend and then uh, many companies follow. Uh, and with this uh, Watson thing, this was uh, the, the first uh, AI system on the planet uh, to beat a human player in a game of chess. Uh, and uh, it has, a, a, like, a, they, they have won, uh, I think, uh, the first the TV show, Jeopardy, it's a uh, kind of very popular show. And uh, uh, the system uh, did beat for the first time, uh, who was the three times winner of uh, that uh, system. And you can see that uh, humans, uh, uh, because that system is a, it's a kind of buzzer thing round. So where you say uh, the building that was a radio tower and you just hit and then you'll have to say Eiffel Tower like that. And that mm -hmm. system has to go through millions of documents and then uh, make sense of those natural languages and then come up with that solution and have that buzzer press before human can do that. And that, that's amazing technology. And that's uh, it's, it's a combination of all traditional uh, algorithms, it's a combination of machine learning, data science, what not, I would say, everything here on the planet they have put into that machine. So it's, uh, uh, they are not going to solve that for free because it's, it's being uh, used in uh, some countries have already allowed to use the system, uh, uh, say in hospitals, uh, to replace or I would say to complement uh, the working of uh, uh, like uh, diagnosis by doctors or nurses and say it's, you recommend something and system can say, oh, you can't do this medication because then person's history five years ago, this happened. So the system is so quick and uh, uh, IBM is uh, kind of shifting its uh, business towards this model. So it's in tourism industry, it's in healthcare now, it's in agriculture now, and few other domains. Uh, but as I said, for our needs, we can start with something smaller. We do not need a system that heavy uh, because as uh, people said, uh, like think you mentioned that not everybody has mobiles, uh, smartphones, internet, people are not gonna use that, so we do not need that heavy system. Uh, plus, uh, the problem with many domain is uh, the knowledge they build the model on, that research was done in the West, it's not for our countries. Okay, so plain example would be medical science. Uh, it's not just, uh, I would say, when most of the medical science was invented, or uh, say we did prescribe antibiotics or whatever, uh, the doses, it was based on the trials done on white males because even at that time there was no that much of equality with the woman. So it's, and nowadays we, we talk about precision medication or precision health. That means uh, for whatever working for you might not work for me. We are different. Uh, so same thing uh, with the, these uh, bigger applications. They are designed keeping the need of farmers in North America. So we can take an inspiration from them we can use whatever is useful for us, but we need to do our own groundwork and build something that is suitable for our needs. So, so we can talk to IBM yeah. in Pakistan about this. So we can talk. To yes, them. but again, they, they, if, I'm, I'm pretty sure if you talk about Watson, they are going to say it. Uh, again, can government can make them an offer, and uh, they can give free to the farmers. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank but you. again, they'll need money. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. uh, we, uh, you can talk later on the tea, so. Sure, thank you. So uh, in the end, I like, doc again, Dr. Abed for, um, for concluding remarks and uh, thinking. Well, uh, not uh, concluding remarks, I just uh, need to say thanks to Professor Dr. Kamal Zuman, Vice Chancellor, Harrod University, Harrod Agriculture University, Raval Pindi. Uh, he couldn't join us, but it was uh, his idea. Uh, and uh, I'm, uh, I must uh, show my gratitude to uh, him. Uh, that they pointed out uh, the presence of these three experts in town and he asked me that uh, if STPI would be interested uh, in having a seminar in PC and agriculture. Uh, I was a bit reluctant and I was thinking agriculture perhaps in Islamabad, talking of agriculture in Islamabad it will not attract uh, the audience and uh, but let's try and uh, I'm impressed it was houseful that many of the guest house I uh, could see uh, they had to go out uh, uh, because of lack of space. Uh, so uh, thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Kamuzman, for it. Uh, just uh, uh, on a positive uh, note, uh, and Dr. Tosif is online. In Pakistan, uh, the work on pristine agriculture has already started. 
uh, it's uh, in the uh, in fancy state, but uh, uh, I can assure you that in uh, next uh, year or so, uh, you will find uh, already the universities and agriculture research community, uh, they have developed uh, uh, the drones to monitor crops. They have developed uh, drones with multi-nozzles uh, uh, to actually differentiate where the pest is in the field and to spray there and to uh, leave uh, uh, all other uh, crop. So with the multi-camera system, uh, they have uh, uh, the sprayers with, uh, uh, which can automatically adjust uh, according to the height of the orchard. Uh, it's just a tractor mounted simple sprayer. So all these things, they are actually now uh, being uh, invented, modified in Pakistan. Uh, Planning Commission and uh, agriculture universities, uh, Comsats, uh, uh, Comstrek, STFA is also part of it and uh, different other. Uh, we are working on it and Dr. Tosif, uh, he's the project director of uh, uh, major precision agriculture program run by the Commission of Pakistan. So hopefully uh, during our annual conference, we'll be discussing more on how to uh, use this uh, wonderful uh, technology that can uh, create a miracle, uh, just like as today we are benefiting from a green revolution. And uh, as Dr. Babur said, green revolution, it is uh, it has its cons, it had its environmental uh, consequences uh, that uh, we are facing today. So maybe 10 years down the road, we'll be facing some uh, social consequences because of the adoption of uh, uh, AI techniques in agriculture. Uh, but uh, for today, I think this is the way forward in order to ensure food security. Uh, we have to adapt uh, mechanization, farm mechanization and artificial intelligence uh, in uh, the field of agriculture. Thank you very much uh, for joining us today. So before leaving, I just request Dr. Abit to uh, present uh, sheets to our uh, panelists. Thank you. Last <laughs> <laughs>